Hello there. In this video, I want to derive the equation of motion for a simple pendulum using Lagrangian mechanics. Of course, we could use simple Newtonian mechanics in order to do this as well, but I want to use this video as a demonstration for how, uh, you know, Lagrangian mechanics works and how we can use Lagrangian mechanics in order to create uh, equations of motion. So right here, I wrote out the, um, the Euler Lagrange equation for us okay and this is our bread and butter in Lagrangian mechanics just like F equals MA is our bread and butter in Newtonian mechanics right this is our fundamental starting point in order to tackle dynamics problems okay now the Lagrangian L is defined as the kinetic energy of my system minus the potential energy of my system that's really easy right now, what are these Q's, okay? These Q's are generalized coordinates, right? And so those could be, you know, angles, theta and phi. They could be, you know, X, Y, and Z, just like Cartesian coordinates. They could be a radial distance R, right? They're generalized coordinates. And we have to define them based on whatever problem that we're interested in, right? And so all that we're really saying here with all of this is that my kinetic and my potential energies are functions of one, the coordinates of my system, two, the time derivatives of those coordinates, and three, time itself. But the reality is one and two, right, our coordinates are really just functions of time as well. Because at the end of the day, we want to find how this object is just moving through space, you know, as a function of time. So of course these coordinates are also going to have time dependence. All right, so with that background out of the way, let's go ahead and look at this pendulum. And the first question that we actually need to ask in order to analyze this guy is, you know, what coordinates do we need to use in order to describe this system? How many coordinates and what kind of coordinates, okay? You know, and I think most of us, just from our experience in physics, you know, we'll immediately know that the answer is just we have one coordinate, we can draw out some vertical, we can measure the angle with respect to that uh, vertical, we call that angle phi, there's our coordinate right there. But I want to be a little bit more careful about this just for the sake of this uh, demonstration here. What we need to find first are the degrees of freedom of our system. So we have degrees of freedom, right, which is the minimum number of independent coordinates necessary to describe, uh, you know, some system of particles. And the degrees of freedom of, of a system are equal to d n minus c. So d refers to the dimensions that our particle occupies, n refers to the number of particles, and c refers to the number of constraints in our system, right? So for this first example, this little mass m, I've defined it so it just it can just move in the paper, right? It can just move in the x and y directions. So here it can move in two dimensions, okay? How many particles do we have? Of course we just have one particle m here, so n is going to be equal to one. And finally, how many constraints do we have? Well, we do have one constraint here, just that we have this rod which has some fixed length l. And of course, that's going to constrain this mass. So we have one constraint as well. So we subtract one, and we can see here that the degrees of freedom for our system is one. Great, so we can use one independent coordinate to describe this system. I'm emphasizing independent, by the way, because, for example, we could think, you know, what if I used some position x and z to describe this mass right like of course x and z are both changing right as the as this particle is going to swing back and forth that's two coordinates right but they're not independent of each other right somehow through this constraint i would always be able to relate you know the change in position x with the change in uh position z or vice versa right they're dependent on each other so Let's just clarify that point as well. All right, awesome. So now we gotta make a choice though for what this independent coordinate is going to be. 
And of course, we know that that is ultimately going to be some angle here, phi, right? Because our constraint can be expressed very, very easily in terms of polar coordinates, right? If I have polar coordinates in which I write positions as r and phi, then this constraint we could just simply write as r is equal to l. My particle is never going to move out or in, it's at some fixed radius l. All right, so let's lock this in in terms of our like uh, q language here, right? So our generalized coordinates q is really just going to be a singular coordinate q1, right? And that is going to be equal to phi. So those are our coordinates that we're going to use for this system. Of course, if we needed more coordinates, this Q would actually be like a vector and we would have a big list of uh, coordinates there. All right, so from here, now we just gotta define our Lagrangian, right? So what do we need for our Lagrangian? We need our kinetic energy as a function of Q1, which is phi, and we need a, you know, a potential energy as a function of that as well. So let's go ahead and figure those out. Let's start with potential energy. So what we know is it would be really, really easy to express potential energy in terms of the height z of this system, right? So we can do that. We'll express it in terms of the height z first, and then from there, we'll rewrite that in terms of polar coordinates, and then we'll be good to go, right? So we'll go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and just draw, you know, indicate that our pendulum is going to start out you know, at this equilibrium position. And I'll go ahead and define that as z is equal to zero, right? And of course, if this has some length l, then, you know, my pendulum is going to have some height because if I break this triangle down here, right, then what is this height right here? Well, if this component of the triangle right here, this is clearly just l cosine of phi, then my height z is just going to be equal to l minus l cosine phi. And there we go. We've already rewritten our height z in terms of, you know, our coordinate that we're interested in phi. So cool. So if we know that the potential energy is just going to be equal to mgz, right? Then we can rewrite this as mg times l times one minus cosine phi. Awesome, so we have our function for u. So next, what we wanna find is our uh, kinetic energy, T, right? And of course, if this, you know, pendulum is swinging and it's at some fixed radius, you know, this m is just going to have, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, tangential velocity, Vt. So, of course, we know that our kinetic energy very easily is going to be one half, m times vt squared and of course vt right is just going to be equal to our angular velocity phi dot times our length l right so i'm just going to substitute that in for vt so this is going to be equal to one half m l squared phi dot squared so what do we need to do from here well we need to take our lagrangian l and we just need to plug it into this Euler-Lagrange equation up here, right? We need to collect some derivatives, and then once we set, uh, you know, all of this equal to zero, we're gonna be good to go. We'll have our equation of motion right there in front of us. So let's go ahead and start, right? We'll go ahead and take dl, dq1 dot, right? And this, of course, this is just going to be equal to dl d phi dot because I've chosen, you know, my only coordinate q1 to be phi. So now we just have to take our derivative with respect to phi dot. And just to be super duper clear, right, phi dot and phi do not depend on each other. Remember, when we define our Lagrangian to begin with, each of these coordinates, they're all, you know, independent of each other. They are dependent on time, right? But the point is, so when I go through and I take, you know, dl d phi dot, you know, any terms with phi, you know, we can treat phi like a constant too. So this is a really simple derivative, right? So we're just going to be left with ml squared phi dot. All right, so next what do we need to do? Well, 
with this dl dq dot the next thing we need to do is we need to take our time derivative of that right ddt so let's go ahead and do that so ddt of this thing oh my goodness look how easy this is this is just going to be ml squared phi double dot our only thing with time dependence is phi dot so we just take the time derivative of that awesome cool so now we have our first term here checked off put a little check good to go so next we need to find this second term here right so let's go ahead and find dl dq1 and this again is just dl d phi and so what's that going to be well we only have one term with phi in it and that's going to be mgl times cosine phi take the derivative of that of that and that's just going to be minus mgl sine phi well look how nice that is now we just got to plug these into the uh the euler lagrange equation so now we have the second term checked off so now I just got to take the difference, take the first term, subtract the second term from the first term, and then we're going to be good to go. So let's do just that. Let's collect these guys. I'm going to take the difference of them. So we have ML squared phi double dot plus MGL sine phi. And this is all going to be equal to zero. And what do you know? This is going to cancel here. I'm going to divide out the L squared. So we're going to have, you know, one over L. And I'm going to be left with phi double dot plus g over l sine phi is equal to zero. And there we go. That's our equation of motion for a simple pendulum. So there's our answer. Uh, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. But uh, other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.